Welcome to the People Property Place podcast with me, your host, Matthew Watts, founder and managing director of Rockbourne. This is a podcast where I share the stories, views, opinions, and career journeys of the movers, shakers, innovators, and leaders in the real estate industry. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Today, I'm joined by Audrey Klein, who's 25 years of global real estate experience. Audrey, you've run your own business. You've held positions at Blackstone, Cromwell Property Group, and Kennedy Wilson. And you currently serve on the board at SFO Capital Partners and Planet Smart City. I know you're passionate about ESG, along with supporting women in real estate private equity. And if that's not enough, you also sit on the corporate board for Great Ormond Street Hospital and have done for the last 11 years. Before we get into all of that, though, because that's incredible, can you give me just a little bit of background on your personal life and story? Sure. So I, I grew up in the States. My mother's Spanish. My dad's from New York. So I had a very kind of, you know, multicultural upbringing. I spent some time in South America before coming to New York and, and doing an investment banking training program. I then went to Chicago to get an MBA, went to Northwestern, and then I went out to San Francisco and I did syndications for Bank of America across a bunch of different asset classes. And that's really where I learned how to, you know, understand a deal and its salient points quickly. You know, so I did. I sold down equity and debt in in transportation transactions, technology, real estate, et cetera. And and I had, there were a couple of guys in the real estate group that were structuring a really interesting fund. It was a tax credit fund where you got a dollar tax write-off for every dollar you invested because the underlying asset was affordable housing. Right. And um, anyway, they were great at structuring, terrible at marketing. And so they pulled me in. And they taught me everything they knew. And we sold, uh, we sold this wonderful fund all up and down the West Coast in, in the U.S. And um, one of the groups that, anyway, that kind of noticed what I was doing was a group called Babcock and & Brown. And uh, they were doing a bunch of deals in Germany. And nobody from their U.K. office wanted to go to Germany to set up that office. And so they gave me, long story short, they gave me a great offer to go to Germany. I am... Um, with with, the, with 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 a senior partner, I set up that office. I helped them establish LP relationships across Europe. Long story short, they sold that business to a large German bank, and I went off and I started my own firm. I had a couple of groups in the states, a couple of funds that put me on retainer. I helped them raise money throughout Europe. I built built my own business. That business over five years, and um, and a group that had a JV with Blackstone Park Hill Real Estate came along and said, hmm, "We want you to run Europe for us." So when did you move to Europe or when did you move to London? Because you were in the US, right? Yeah. I, well, I moved to, so I moved to Germany in 2000. Right. And then, well, actually 1998, 1999. And then um, once Park Hill did a deal with me to incorporate my platform into what, what, was, in what, what is now Park Hill Real Estate, yeah. I moved to London in 2005. Got it. And I've been here ever since. So from the US, you moved over here because no one would come over to London or Europe. You kind of stayed, set up your own business, and then your business was acquired or you merged it with Park Hill and, and mm-hmm. had the JV Yeah, so they gave me shares. And, and then when Blackstone bought us, it, those became Blackstone shares. And, and uh, so it, it worked out really ni- nicely from that standpoint. <laughs> and so did you have a, because I appreciate when you were in banking initially, it was quite broad sector. Did you have a desire to get into real estate or was it just more around banking and and the economics and financial aspects that interest you and then being exposed to real estate as an asset class you thought actually I'm really interested in this and especially the affordable piece I really like that so I'm going to specialize well so yeah it uh, it, it didn't really happen exactly like that so when I had my own firm I was raising money for pr- corporate private equity funds biotech funds uh, venture capital funds, hedge funds, um, and real estate funds. And um, I really liked real estate because you could see it, touch it, feel it, et cetera. And I actually come from a real estate family. Right. So I could relate to all of that. And um, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've always liked, you know, different types of architecture. I've liked so much about the real estate space that it just kind of re- resonated with me. You know, I was like, that when, when, I was, when I was given the offer to focus on real estate, it wasn't a tough decision. So, and, and I took it as a real challenge. And it was also a challenge to build a business in Europe again. So I had built my own business over five years and I had the chance to build Park Hill Real Estate's business, which turned out to be a fairly successful business. And 
In terms of Blackstone's awareness and brand and prowess at the time, can you give me a bit of insight into Blackstone as a firm in early 2000? Sure. It was, well, it was early days, you know, it was, so Blackstone hadn't built out its in-house marketing team at all yet. This was pre-IPO. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I was, I was surrounded by some of the smartest people I'd ever met, you know, and I was very conscious of that. I said, oh my God, I'll never have this opportunity <laughs> again, you know? And, and not only that, but it wasn't quite post-IPO became very institutional, you know, and, and, um, you know, in, in, in good and bad ways, I think. But before that, I am, um, people were still kind of friendly, helping each other out. It's very entrepreneurial. And I really enjoyed that. I mean, I, I, I helped them bring in some of their, you know, first European investors. I mean, they had a couple, but, you know, I helped kind of expand that base. Yeah. And, and help the, help build the Blackstone brand, you know. So it was, it was a really special time. So you joined the business and do you go in as head of fundraising or did you have, you know, a job title like that? Or you clearly had a remit to go and raise capital from various LPs. Yeah. So, the- I, so, so I, I was, my, my, my title was managing director yeah. um, and, and head of Europe for, for Parker Real Estate. And basically, um, Half of, at that time, half our business were Blackstone funds and half were third party funds. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and funds that didn't compete with Blackstone. So they were between 300 million and a billion in size. And, and as Blackstone built out their in-house marketing team, our Blackstone business became smaller in size. And so our third party business was, was more of a, of a focus, Yeah. you know, and, and that third party business was in Asia and in Canada and, and, and Europe and the U S, you know, so it was, it was, it was a real global experience. And so were you raising money from pension funds, family offices, endowment funds? And what was the strategy behind Yeah, whoever would give that? it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, every, it, was, it was the whole spectrum. It's everything from like, yeah, family offices all the way to, you know, endowments and pension funds. And in terms of you, your team at, this, at the time, was it just you? And were you on the road going and build those relationships? Or were you dealing with placement agents? Or did you have in-house support as well? Not, I mean, most of us, the support was in the US. So we had some great project managers, you know, especially out of Chicago. Um, the team there was, was particularly good. And I ended up hiring a couple of people in Europe. You know, one of them has gone on to do great things. One of them is a partner now at Sarah Advisory, a guy named Bailey Punderari. So yeah, so it, for the most part, it was a very lean team. You know, we didn't hire very many people. So I was on the road all the time. Yeah. All the time. So what, you, on your LinkedIn, you say you've established relationships with over 200 institutional institutions and, and family offices and have raised over 2 billion quid's worth of equity, certainly at your time at Blackstone. Mm-hmm. What makes a really good LP, GP relationship? Listening to what the other side has to say. You know, I mean, there are far too many people who just go out and just flog deals, just sell whatever to whoever. You know, and, and one of the things that I think is really important in a role like fundraisers is to be an LP's trusted advisor, Yeah. you know, and to, to look at it as, as a very much a long-term game. And has that, has that relationship changed over the years since you started doing it? Or is that still at the core and the essence of what makes a good relationship? I think that's the core and the essence of what makes a good fundraiser. I don't, I don't think, I mean, people have all kinds of ways to go about this, but you know, I look at investors as my friends and people that, you know, I want them to think highly of me and the investment that they've made. And, and is, there a, is there a difference between fundraising, capital raising, and then the investor relations piece? Or is it one of, one of the same? Um, you know, in some shops, they, they, split the, they, they split the task. Yeah. You know, but I think a good fundraiser is a good investor relations person. I mean, you know, when they split the task, the investor relations person is, you know, following up and and finding out whether or not the investor is happy with the way things are going and, and they have any special reporting requirements and making sure that, that, that the relationship is, is seamless from a delivery standpoint. Yeah. So, so th- sometimes there is a difference, sometimes there isn't. Yeah, it just know? depends on the shop and how they, they split it. Sure. How, so you were with Blackstone for nine years. Can you paint a picture of how, you know, why you left at that time and what you'd accomplished? before leaving? Sure. So Blackstone sold all of its advisory businesses in 2014 to PJT. I kind of felt like I had had a good run and uh, wanted to do something else. And so how how did the role at Cromwell come around? Basically because I knew the the, act, the then acting CEO, and he asked me to come on board and be part of his management team. And he liked what you'd done and the relationships and the equity that you'd raised in a previous uh, Blackstone, and he wanted you to kind of replicate that? Right. 
at, at Cromwell and help him turbo try, turbocharge his fundraising efforts as well. Mm -hmm. And you were there for a couple of years mm -hmm. before moving to Kennedy Wilson. Can you tell me about, you know, A, what you achieved at Cromwell and then what prompted the move to, to move over to Kennedy Wilson and pick up a new challenge? Yeah, so I think, I think what I, the, the biggest contribution that I made to Cromwell was to kind of emphasize the fact that you have to keep in touch with investors in order for them to be sticky and move with you to a new product. Yeah. You know, that philosophy philosophy was not in place at the time that I was there. I think it's gotten better over time. And I think that, you know, there have been people there that have built on 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 what I tried to kind of espouse. Yeah. So yeah, so basically they I so I, I left Cromwell because they kind of changed their strategy. They put all of their European assets into a Singapore REIT. And so, you know, so there was really no reason to continue to try to raise money at that time. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so for you, the opportunity Kennedy Wilson came up to, to go and be head of fundraising and again, build on the relationships and draw, yeah, draw on those trust tokens and, and relationships with, with capital to bring that money into to their various funds and properties that they were looking at, at right. building out. It was actually one fund. One fund. Mm -hmm. And is it, in terms of real estate, have you always had an affordable angle or a residential angle, or is it quite broad brush within real estate asset classes? <laughs> Broad brush. So, yeah. I mean, so right now I'm really, I'm really enjoying being on the board of Planet Smart City, yeah. which has a focus on affordable housing. Right. You know, and, and they're doing it in emerging markets where demand far outstrips supply. And they're doing it in a very creative way. You know, they're putting, they put the, the, the client, they put the, the, um, the tenant at, at the center of what they do. You know, like, what does this tenant need? And they, um, and it's very much of an impact play too combined with ESG. So there's there are all kinds of resources that are made available for the tenants in this community, you know, and they try they do their best to build a community around the tenant. Yeah, I hadn't come across them before, before I'd done my yeah. research just in terms of in terms of you and your background. So sure. yeah, I'm fascinated to understand how how you landed or, or, or why you wanted to move into an NED type role, because you're a non-exec director at Planet Smart City, but also SFO. Mm -hmm. And then can you just tell me a little bit more about those businesses and what your sure. role looks like. Yeah, sure. So, so at Planet Smart City, I helped them. You know, I, I helped them start to craft their ESG platform, and they've done a great job with that. They've actually hired a head of ESG now. So, is it Planet Smart City? It's focused on is it emerging countries or emerging markets, or how would you how would you categorize? Is there India and Brazil, right, uh, among other places, right? Uh, India, Brazil, and Colombia. In Colombia, right now. Yeah. And so in terms of them as a business, are they planning on expanding with those geographies or are they taking the are they going to take the model and kind of replicate that in in kind of more western cities as well? Um they're they're staying in emerging markets actually. And their whole aim the, you know the whole point is that is that the affordable housing that's available in these countries is is dire. I mean right. there's there's not, you know, they a lot of them a lot of what's available looks like chicken hutches, you know what I mean? It's yeah. you know, it's pretty bad. So there's a real opportunity to disrupt the small to medium sized developer in, in affordable housing. And, and affordable, by affordable housing, I don't mean social housing. I mean workforce housing, you know, for the policemen, nurses, teachers, et cetera, that have been placed out of the city, but that service the city, Fine. you know? And are, they, and are they modular constructed or how do they go about building this at scale? Yeah, so, yeah, so they, are, they are modular, actually. There are different offerings within every community. You know, some are a little bit more expensive than others. Like anywhere, they they go for anywhere from twenty thousand to thirty thousand yeah. dollars each, and and the the tenants receive financing from the state or or you know it's taken from their pe their pay or or well no it's not taken from their pay that so you know it's kind of like a Sally Mae function you know where the state provides a certain amount of financing like you they go to to buy a $20,000 house and the state will give them some kind of uh financing option right got it okay makes sense yeah and so in terms of your role there i know you're heavily involved with the ESG aspect of it mm -hmm. but are you also utilizing the skills that you have from a fundraising sure and equity raising perspective to enable further expansion and scale of those projects? Sure. So um, we've already raised about 176 million and looking to raise another 50 million or so wow. before 
the, the whole plan is to go public. And are you doing that personally or, you, or is there a team and you're kind of overseeing it and holding them to account? Yeah, there's a, there's a team. I mean, I, as, a, as a board member, I provide oversight, Quite. you know, so um, I'm not an employee. You're not, you're, okay, fine. So no. you're not, you're not actively mm-hmm. doing that, but you're, you're certainly leveraging your relationships with the wider industry sure. and the team are doing that. That's and right. then tell, how, tell me about SFO Capital Partners and how did that come about? So SFO just, you know. The, through through relationships with the relationship with the um with the CEO, I think they're a really smart, savvy group. They really just established themselves in in London about a year and a half ago. They've done a great job. So they've been doing multifamily in the U.S. for quite some time. They've got a great track record there. They're establishing a track record in Europe. I have helped them establish a, an ESG platform kind of checklist, you know, to to go forward with. And um, I'm introducing them to some institutional investors. Well, wow, nice. Yeah. Just to help scale again their European platform. So uh, coming back to the the capital raising piece, in your opinion, what separates like a high performer in this space compared to someone who's quite average or okay at the job? Um, two things. Well, number one, I think you need a lot of energy to be a good fundraiser. And uh, I, I think I think I think the person who sits down and listens and tries to solve, you know, so, 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 tries to provide solutions for the person sitting across from them. Yeah. So, and listens to what the LP is looking for. I, it's, you know, and that's separate from, you know, the, the type of fundraiser that has a deal they have to sell down or have to deal they have to raise money for and just kind of dials for dollars, you know, and, and doesn't. Or, sees or it as a numbers or, game. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in a certain sense, it is a numbers game. Yeah. But I, I think it's really important to be targeted and, and keep good notes or mental notes, at least, you know, and know what people are looking for what their kind of I also think it's you know what their risk appetite is. I also think it's really important to visit investors or to talk to investors when you're not selling something. Just what, give them have, insights in terms of who else is raising capital or what kind of product or funds sure. are being raised or sure. just some or just value market out. or just you know market information. I just you know it's a relationship. Yeah. At the end of the day. And do you do you find it easier or more challenging to raise capital from certain parts of the world or you know sure. do you, or is it you know, easier, you know, whether in your career or you're in Korea or the US or China or the Middle East or out in APAC? The US has a far greater number of the type of investors that invest in real estate private equity than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's true that like over the last 15 years, Asian investors have developed into this space. Yeah. But, you know, by far, the more sophisticated investors are from the US. Yeah. So definitely an easier market. Where does impact fit into the fundraising equation right now? Because there's, you know, there's quite a lot of talk about impact investing and mm-hmm. ESG. And is it just a buzzword? And, and how, how important is it for alloc- you know, capital allocators to, you know, how much due diligence are they doing on, on GPs when they're allocating capital from an impact and ESG perspective? I don't think you can paint a, you know, you can paint a broad brushstroke as to how investors are doing due diligence. It's it's a new area and I think it's still being defined. Yeah. I'm delighted to see that it's actually becoming kind of an asset class because it's greatly needed. You know, I mean I just think that, you know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, I think there's a great need for impact investing. Yeah. And it's kind of nice to see that it's coming into its own finally. And so more people are or more more LPs are, are looking for funds to back. And they're more they're more GPs setting up impact investing vehicles right. that aren't just washing vehicles, but are generally really purpose driven and having a really positive positive impact from both a qualitative and quantitative perspective on local industries. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, I think you know, there's certainly you know GPs that are trying to call vehicles impact that aren't, but <laughs> but you know, I guess that's kind of you know in the eye of the beholder, really. <laughs> Or the LP. Yeah, quite. So it, it must be a relatively challenging, I mean, as we sit here on the 13th of December today, it must be a relatively challenging landscape for anyone trying to raise capital right now. Sure. With you know, the bond and equity markets probably being a little bit more receptive to market moves and dropping a bit faster. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the real estate industry and capital values being marked down right now. Mm-hmm. What, what advice would you give to someone who's trying to raise money in a market that there's a little bit of fluctuation in at the moment? Yeah, they need to have a lot of patience because, I mean, you know, the, the markets pretty much, except for credit, the markets came to a standstill in 2009, 10 and part of 11. You know, I don't think it'll ever be that bad in our lifetime again. But it's there's, you know, we're, we're in a we're in an environment where interest rates have risen for the first time in, in a lot of people's careers 
So, um, so yeah, so I think there, there are a lot of investors that basically haven't done anything the past quarter. They're just waiting, you know, waiting to see what happens next quarter. I mean, real estate has to correct, you know, I mean, still it's, it's, it's overvalued, overpriced yeah. in just about every asset class. So there's a lot that has to happen to make real estate really attractive on a relative basis. To other asset classes. To other asset classes in 2023. So how do you see the market then at the moment and what does need to happen for it to be attractive? Certainly for people who are raising funds or, or you know, investing, I mean, they, the price of assets needs to correct. And is that what, 5 to 30% or? Probably 20%. <laughs> 20%. And what with the interest rates settling off as well and there being a, a kind of a new normal base rate before? People have got more clarity and conviction in, in terms of deploying further capital. Sure, in general. So you've had an incredibly successful and varied career. How do you how do you balance that on a professional and personal basis, combined with the charitable aspects as well of your, your the activities and things that you're interested in? I, I do what I enjoy, you know, and so I think that goes a long way. You know, when you ask me about balance, everybody's got a different definition of balance. I mean, I feel balanced when I have the opportunity to travel somewhere else, go somewhere else, you know, to uh, to be able to do what I do. So um, whereas a lot of people get exhausted by travel, I don't. I, I get I get real energy from it. So, for example, hence one of the um, hence one of you know, energy being one of the key things in terms of a successful capital raiser that you mentioned earlier. Sure. Otherwise, it's going to burn out. Sure. So, is that what gives you the the ability to get involved with women in real estate? And can you talk to me about that wire as it's kind of coined in a little bit more detail? Because you know, suddenly optically, it looks like it's growing, and there's so many events that you're championing, and lots of people are getting involved with it. Sure, and you know what's really great is like we've had a, we've had a lot of support from a lot of the key men in the industry, you know, which I think is really really important, you know. And um, I mean, I started Wire in London 12 years ago because I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'd go to a conference or anywhere related to real estate, and I was the only woman in the room, you know, and, and, um, and there are very subtle challenges that come along with that. And I'm sure not you know? so subtle as well. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and not so subtle, exactly. So, um, yeah, so Trish Berga and Mon- Monica O'Neill and I, we, you know, started Wire and, and you know, it started very small. And, and now we have over 400 women and, and um, we have some great firms that have sponsored us, you know, in various events like Orion and Eastill and Delancey and, um, and Deutsche Finance, you know, so just to name a few. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, they've been really supportive and, and it's been great. So as a group, what's its purpose? Is it networking and support for women in real estate, private equity? Sure. So it's so it's um, twofold. So it's networking and it's also educational. You know, so, you know, we try to provide kind of of, um, panels on different topics like life sciences, you know, current topics. So life sciences is a real kind of place of growth. Quite. You know, as a class, it's growing. And uh, we try to provide a space, a safe space for junior women to learn from senior women, you know, as far as like career path goes and stuff. So, you know, um, it's it's networking and, and education, you know, and, and people, you know, you you may wonder, you know, why do you have to have a even even today a, a separate group called women in real estate? Well, I'll explain to you why. So when, when you get to senior levels, only 17% of the C-suite are women. You know, at the board level, it's even worse. It's 4.9%. Wow. You know, and these numbers come from Prequin, you know, which, is, which is, has, has some good data. Yeah. You know, so those numbers are too small. And, and, you know, you may say, you know, why do you need women in the C-suite? You know, why do you need women? in real estate anyway, you know, and, and the reason is that, you know, funds, firms, et cetera, perform better when there's a more balanced firms that are more diverse. Yeah. Yeah. More balanced, more equitable, more insight. Mm-hmm. I c- sure. completely get it. Yeah. What, Different points of view. What, what do you think as a headhunter, or if you are a headhunter, what do you think that I could do or we could do as a business or other people listening to this could do to help promote that or make it easier? Is it try and signpost people to wire? Is it hold clients to account for rather than just paying lip service to wanting to have diverse shortlists, like actually making sure that they're following through with their demand? What, what, what can we do? Yeah, so, you know, a, a couple of things. Maybe make, make, groups, make groups that are like, you know, on the cover, uh, 
heavily weighted in, in one gender, you know, explain to them that it's not that that's not going to help them in the long run, you know, as far as like they could do better as far as performance goes, if they have a more mixed kind of community, you know, especially in leadership positions. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of investors are kind of frowning on, you know, any single single gender fund management team or real estate management team. You know what I mean? So just make them aware of what the data is. Yeah. You know? And do you see, in terms of the representation, do you see women being over allocated typically to capital raising or asset management? Or is it more investment or within the debt space or equity space? Or is there a particular area or sector that's particularly underrepresented or weighted against the norm? I think, you know, I think that where where women are under grossly underrepresented in general is really just at senior levels you know it really doesn't matter whether you're talking about asset management investment fundraising etc you know it's, it's it's across the board it's across the board at senior levels you know um i'm talking about the c suite i'm talking about board positions yeah you know it's that that's that's where the power is <laughs> so so for someone who wants to get involved with why where where should they look and where can they where can they go to um, become part of the the group or the community? So we're we're working on a new website, which will be up and running in in Q one of twenty twenty three. We also we've we've also established a couple of LinkedIn pages, you know, so you can find us there. And uh, we have five board members based in London. It's myself, Matilda Tolico from from Rock Point, Maria Svetkova from NREP, Monica O'Neill from Imabel, and Mina Kujuri from Harrison Street. So, you know, you can get in touch with any one of us. We're, we're happy to, um, you know, to bring you in. Amazing. That sounds great. I'm conscious of time and I've got so many more questions for you, but just a couple just before we draw to a close. What, what advice would you give someone entering the world of real estate now and who maybe to be more specific wants to get into the kind of the capital and fundraising part of it go somewhere where you can learn first you know go somewhere where you can learn as 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 much as you can and um and a lot of times those are the bulge bra bracket firms you know or the bigger firms you know like um like you know one of the big banks or investment banks or you know one of the bigger fundraising organizations like you know evercore or but one of, one of the bigger firms yeah yeah you know um and and then you know you know learn all you can first couple of years and then yeah. you know then the sky's the limit really because like everybody needs capital yeah. that's the that's the beauty of this business you it'll know? be there's no there's no shortage of capital looking for a good home that's or right. a good return on investment right so what do the 12 next 12 months look like for you personally Wow, I wish I could tell you everything, but uh, I have uh, I've been talking to a group and and um, I'm going to join a group as a partner and help continue to to grow their fundraising business. Amazing, yeah. that sounds great. Mm -hmm. And and finally, if you were given five hundred million pounds worth of equity that you raised yourself, who are the people? What property? In which place would you look to deploy that cash? Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunity in Western. In, in the western part of the world so europe and and the us so as as far as like it depends you know what your risk appetite is affordable mark affordable housing in in emerging markets i think that's a place where demand far outstrips supply yeah i think if you're with a good manager in that space that's that's the place to to go into to emerging markets otherwise as the asset classes start to become more attractive over the next 12 months i would say diversify across yeah. as many you know don't put all of your 500 million in one place yeah you know just diversify as much as you can in geographies and in the western world and um and uh yeah i think um i i think credit is going to be the first stop yeah. so i think there's going to be a lot of opportunity in the credit space um and, and i think it'll just go on from there and who if you're going to assemble a team to help you deploy that who who would who would be the trusted three or four people that you'd want one on board Oh, you know what? I'd offend too many people if I gave you my top three or four people. So well, I'm going to keep that to myself. <laughs> well, I guess as as someone who is probably the most connected or one of one of the most connected people in the real estate space, I'll, I'll let you off on that because uh, I think there's far too many people that, like you said, you would upset right. because um, you could build multiple teams of super, super high performing individuals. But look, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing a little bit of insight into your background, how you see the market and some advice for, for people who are keen to get into the space. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the People Property Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague, subscribe, give us a rating, like or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of which guests you think we should get on the podcast or areas of the market that we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People Property Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. The team recruit experienced talent for real estate private equity firms, investment managers, REITs, property companies, and advisory firms across the investment, asset management, development, fund management, ESG, cap markets, investor relations, and general practice space. So if you're considering your career options at the moment or looking to attract top talent to come and work for you, head over to the website, www.rockborn.com, where you can find a wealth of resource to aid your search. Have a great day wherever you are, and I look forward to catching you next time.